Hi everyone and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is Rachel Pether and I'm a Senior Advisor to Skybridge Capital based in Abu Dhabi, as well as being the MC for SALT, a thought leadership forum and networking platform that encompasses business, technology and politics. SALT Talks is a series of digital interviews with some of the world's foremost investors, creators and thinkers. And just as we do at our Global Salt Conference series, we aim to provide our audience a window into the mind of subject matter experts. Today, we're going to be focusing on family offices and digital assets, and that includes everything from the spectrum, from cryptocurrencies to NFTs and digital art. And I'm very excited to be speaking to Roxanne Davies, who's the managing partner of Pali Singapore. Now, Roxanne is a seriously impressive woman. She's a senior investment professional with multi-decades of experience running family offices and ultra high net worth departments within private banks. She moved to Asia a little over a decade ago to set up and run Pali Singapore, which is the Asian arm of a 900 year old European family based out of Switzerland. She's been a speaker at multiple industry conferences, including SALT, sits on the investment committee of several global family offices, and has held a number of board positions. She has a master's degree in finance and an MBA from HEC Geneva, and if that's not enough, she speaks four languages. Roxanne, welcome to SALT Talks. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Maybe we could start by you telling me a bit more about you and, and providing a bit more color on who you are. Um, sure, thank you. So I um, have been working with families for about 30 years. I was lucky I ended up in this incredible family office when family offices weren't really a word, um, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s. And this family specifically put about a billion and a half to work in um, alternative um assets, uh, private equity, hedge funds, et cetera, and, you know, had offices around the world. So I was able as a foot soldier to kind of learn and, and grow with this, this industry. And my focus really was on research and risk management. So I had to do deep dives into um, hedge funds and how they work and how people are thinking and how these great, brilliant minds are thinking and who, how to recognize talent and solve problems. And that was really the start of my career, which took me to, you know, Asia, as well as um, Brazil and Russia and so on and so forth. So I was, I was fortunate. You know, you're obviously very international. So you're Swiss, but you were born in New York City and you've lived all over the world. What originally took you to Singapore? Was it as part of this family office? Correct. So we purchased a listed financial services company around 2009 when we had a very complex operational structure with managed accounts globally. So the, the component of a fund administration technology was important to us. And we thought that a, we bought a listed financial services company, which had a trust license, which we thought was an excellent mid to back office solution for families. Well, we in the process sold it a few years ago, but um, you know, we are still, I would say this family is a highly progressive family when it comes to operational and, um, you know, admin and, you know, where you're custodying your assets, how it's custodied, how it's structured, how are you executing trades? This, this type of thing is a, is a very important part of the investment process. And you mentioned that you're, you know, you're in research and risk management, but the, the traits that you often use are like problem solving and, and finding talent, given that you've worked with family offices for so long, maybe you could talk a bit about what are some of the skills that you think are really important when working with family offices? That's a really great question. And I really feel like it depends on the archetype of the family office in itself. What do they want? And in the ideal world, I would say the, the EQ component as well as the IQ and investment management expertise are both the main, um, you know, two of the most important parts of the, uh, of the equation to have a great long-term family office professional. But essentially you have to have a character that is flexible and that is able to, you know, um, operate in a non-institutionalized framework in a general sense. There are plenty of family offices that are now highly institutionalized you know, um, very, very well-organized professional backgrounds, but most of them are flexible 
And so you need to be able to work from home or work from anywhere or be able to handle um, various different tasks when they come to, you know, when they come to your desk or office, basically. So you have to deal with different family members and the issues around them. So it's a person, it's a people job. And then on the other side, um, problem solving is a, is a large word for anything that's investment related. You have to have the curiosity and be able to understand how things work, be able to derive parallels across things that you find, you know, that you see evolving, for example, and um, having been in the, you know, alternative asset management industry, I have seen a lot of things that look similar to me. They may not be exactly the same things. If you talk to experts, they're never going to be able to, you're never going to be able to co compare, let's say, Hadoop to blockchain. But we look at those factors as similar factors as to how did that, meta, you know, change the universe of data analytics versus today, what are the applications and um, businesses that can be built on a distributed ledger system, for example, as, a, as opposed to a digital file system. Yeah, and I'd love to go into a bit more detail about that distributed ledger technology because I, I know this is an area you're very passionate about as well. But I thought what you said about EQ was really interesting. And I guess that applies both externally on the investment side, but also more importantly, as you mentioned, sort of navigating the, the family dynamics and the family politics as well. Sure. And as much as you can, you should avoid those things. But uh, sometimes you can't. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the EQ also comes to play with as an allocator. And I've been doing the allocation to hedge fund managers, private equity managers, fund managers in general, um, or company CEOs for a long time. And you are, you know, you have limited time with them and you have limited um, ability to sort of sink in as much as you may want to. So you have to, after thousands or hundreds of interviews, you kind of get your red flags up and that's a something that you really can't quantify. It's an art versus a science, but it's extremely important to sort of be able to recognize new talent. That's a very important part of what we do. We have seated many managers, um, many of them very successful. Um, and, you know, that that's an area where I think that we, you know, day one investments or seating managers, we were very successful. And um, I was lucky to be you know, with some of the great managers of their very first day of trading. So I feel very good about that. Wow, that's amazing. I'm sure it was a combination of, of luck and skill, but you're right. I mean, the seeding manager business, as many of us know, is a very, very tough one. So it's certainly difficult to, to spot both the talent and also the underlying investment thesis as well. And, you know, what I thought was really interesting is that you mentioned that the family that you work with is invested or decided to invest quite some years ago, $1.5 billion in alternatives. And I know you were really, I mean, maybe saying one of the forerunners is perhaps a bit strong, but I do really think you are one of the leaders in the sort of digital assets, cryptocurrency space. So maybe rewind a few years and tell me how you first got comfortable with the space and what was your own research and risk management process leading up to it? So um, the 1.5 was absolutely in the hedge fund and private equity world. And that was, um, you know, a different family. This family has dabbled and we certainly haven't been comfortable with, um, you know, large scale institutional investments in this area, but we've been looking at it for a while. So um, we have direct and indirect investments. Um, personally, I started getting interested in it, um, watching my children to be, honestly, uh, to be honest with you, um, just seeing how they play games, how they, you know, value certain things. So for them, for example, a skin is akin to an NFT. Um, the skins are valuable. Um, the way they play games, the way they trade, the mining, the way they communicate with people that they don't know, how they can cooperate in certain um, specific uh, clash of clans type of game, for example, in the day. So I just watched how some of these games were developing and even something like Minecraft, for example, many, many years ago when my kids were playing that, some, a friend of mine had built out the Minecrafter YouTube social net. So there were these very famous influencers on YouTube that represented Minecraft. And I believe the whole concept was similar, which is the Minecraft or um, Lady Gaga would actually bring in the advertising um, revenues to themselves. 
right? As opposed to be able to give, let's say, a YouTube or another um, platform full rights and, you know, um, revenue. So it was really, that was kind of a social net, which we thought was an interesting model. That company and specifically um, has, you know, changed names and changed um, DNA a couple of times, but the concept is the same. We still think that this is an interesting, you know, development. And then Steam It was also from Dan Larimer, the similar concepts where the creators own the information, own their own information, and are able to share it and get revenue back. So that brings us to the NFT world. Mm. And before we dive a bit further into the NFT world, so when your kids come to you asking for, say, birthday or Christmas presents, is that mainly in the in the physical world or the, the digital world? Where is their where is their focus? Depends on the child, but um, most of, most both of them. And most of the kids that I know, so all the nieces and nephews would be focused more on the virtual than the physical. And I've had comments throughout, you know, the last uh, few years, um, like, oh, you know, what? I don't want your Hermes bag, or I don't care about this art piece, or I wouldn't want any of these things. And I, I actually believe that there's a, a change in philosophy and a mindset of this generation that I think is very interesting consumer trend. Mm. And I guess you've got that cross-generation sort of split or dichotomy. With your global perspective, have you also seen a divergence or difference between cultures? Like, do you think that Asian families are more comfortable with alternatives or digital assets than, say, Europeans and, and Americans, for example? I think that the Asian family offices are as likely to invest in these as other families. I don't think it's a cultural thing to go for it or against it. It will really depend on their risk tolerance and their access. So access is not as easy as it was, for example, to set up Coinbase or Cumberland or Kraken, et cetera. So some of those um, exchanges and custodies that are considered somewhat safe were not accessible by everybody. Um, so it really just depends on the specific family. Um, mm -hmm. However, I think that, um, there has been, so in China, they had more than 50% of the trading volume globally. So this, so China representing a big part of what, um, what we're talking about when we talk about Asia, definitely they're highly, highly advanced in Binance, for example, Neo, et cetera. These are all Chinese or Asian um, you know, innovations and companies. So I would say it's on an equal footing um, however, on a regulatory front, it's different. So is it considered a collectible? Is it considered a currency? Is it considered a security? How is it going to be taxed? Does tax make a difference? Um, what are the main reasons for, you know, the buy and hold? Um, that kind of thing is, is different. So I would say that would a family office now collect digital assets, um, like an NFT, like be part of a Beeple purchase? Yes. I, uh, there was, you know, a few months ago, a friend of mine was talking to me about uh, a Japanese artist that had created these tokens that he was very interested in and, you know, they bought them. But I still think that it's still, it's still early days. I'd love to go into the, the Japanese artist side because you did share some of those pictures and videos with me and they were amazing. But I just wanted to ask a quick question on the regulatory environment within Singapore, because it is actually a jurisdiction that Abu Dhabi has looked to emulate as well, particularly on the financial regulation front. So maybe tell me a bit about what is it about Singapore in particular that makes it such a good place for digital assets, whether that's purchasing or, or storing or custody, et cetera. Singapore is, of course, a very rational wealth management destination. That's, their, that's the very... Um, important goal for Singapore as a country, and it's been on the innovation, it's ranked on the highest innovation lists. It is a digital economy, um, and it puts its money where its mouth is. So there are, you know, there's a complete push from, you know, all parts of the government and subparts specialized to really um, uh, bolster the digital economy. But that doesn't necessarily mean only crypto. So the Project Yubin is a um, Singapore dollar uh, digital effort that's been going on for several years, maybe even five. So it's, 
it's to say that there has been a lot of experimentation on this side, similar to the digital one, which has been test marketed in a couple of cities in China. So the, the main currency separate from that would be the, then the payments component of it, right? So it's a unit of exchange, it's a transferable asset, so to speak. So Singapore already in 2018, 2019, updated the Payment Services Act, um, looked at how to license, looked at features, and it has to take its time on a regulatory basis to really assess you know, the cybersecurity issue when there were plenty of um, uh, hacks and thefts, and that's not okay. So how do you handle the cybersecurity? How do you handle the AML CFT component for kind of the dark web and all the illicit um, you know, trading that was that, that is kind of linked to this in the main, you know, in headlines, but not aren't really, um, you know, where the potential of uh, of cryptocurrency and blockchains lie. So, how do you tax it? How do you create a legal framework? Um, what are the AML and CFT um, protocols that are need to be used? Um, how do you uh, resolve a dispute? What is a dispute framework going to look like? That type of thing needed to be tested. So today, I would say they're testing a lot of the blockchain technologies on this, um, whether, and, and Tomasic is intricately involved in all of this, um, our, as are some banks, SGX, um, the Singapore Exchange, et cetera, and DBS, one of the main banks, I think was one of the first to get the recognized market operator as a legitimate digital asset um, exchange and broker dealer, so to speak. So you, you know, the licensing component first is given so that they can test run a few of these to make sure that their their economy doesn't get negatively impacted by reputation or or by actual losses. Yeah, and I guess it's it's quite hard for a regulator to maintain that balance between sufficient robust regulation and innovation. I do think that's something Singapore's managed to do pretty well on that side. And as you say, it has a great reputation. It is an, an excellent private wealth destination too. So they can't really afford to have any reputational risk damage or any scandal in the, you know, the, that digital asset regulatory space. Right. So, and then there's the overseas. So how do you connect with others? Um, so they have to also be, um, they're, you know, uh, cognizant of what the US is doing or what Europe is doing. And what China's doing, they have to bring all of these features. And so it's an ongoing, it's a, it's fluid. Evolution, indeed. And so now we can move on to the really fun stuff. Uh, you mentioned the 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 artwork, um, the Japanese artist, and you actually shared an incredibly impressive digital painting with me last month, I think it was. So let's now sort of pivot slightly towards, towards digital art. And where do you see as some of the areas, the greatest areas for growth in the digital asset world and, and maybe talk a bit more about the, the digital art space as well? The digital art space is, is fascinating. Um, however, art in itself can be, art, the physical art world has been manipulated for years. So the digital art world, you know, you have to, you definitely need to be careful. Do I think that there is, um, do I understand someone who would buy an initial um, JPEG of, of the first tweet or of um, the, the artworks of, of, of people, I do get it. It's the first, right? So it's kind of interesting. If you're in the collectibles business, it's interesting. Now, you, you know, you can always look at various different perspectives to say, you know, who's, you know who is actually um, incentivized to make sure that this is a market that, that, you know, booms and so on and so forth. But again, going back to my children, <laughs> um, if there was a skin, for example, in one of their games that they could buy and keep for themselves, or there was a limited edition, I believe because most of these are owned still by the game companies. Um, however, if there was a means to have this owned by themselves so that, you know, they could then play and it either had some superpower to it or, or some aesthetic component to it, I do believe that they would go insane over something like that. So, um, so I do see that this, as much as, for example, for the older generation, including myself, it's sort of a, you know, head scratcher. Um, I do understand how 
the um, this generation, the younger generation would value this, um, you know, have value this for the long run because this is coded in their culture and their DNA. And Asia, I would say, particularly is um, is incredible with collectibles and especially art. Um, they they just love that, and and the Pokemon's of this world, etc. They're all, and a lot of the extraordinary games are really, um, you know, uh, created here and played here, and, and taken very seriously here. So, you know, the um, esports, etc. This this is not a it's not a hobby. This is a commerce. This is a real industry. So I think that that's to NFT is here to stay. That being said, is there going to be manipulation and issues um, linked to this? Yes. Um, you know, of course, this is just the beginning of this world. But if you think about, let's say, an Andy Warhol um, foundation, could they create a, one image that, you know, that is the original image of a digital, um, you know, iconic uh, an iconic digital image and then sell it? Sure, why not? Is it worth it? I don't know. <laughs> Yes, it's so interesting. And maybe, you know, for those on the phone, and I must admit that A, I'm part of the older generation that you mentioned, and B, I only know about people because you told me before about it. But for those that are listening that aren't so familiar with Beeple Mania and the Beeple story, could you talk us through that and how this how this gentleman became a bit of an icon in the art Well, world? he's a digital artist. And, and lately, and I think uh, most of your... Um, listeners and users uh, and, and viewers would have seen this. It was on Financial Times as well recently that there was a Christie's auction of all his digital art um, over the last 13 years for like $69 million. And um, he's just a digital artist with the following. And um, it's, it's kind of interesting when you think about art, and this is more of an art question, as in some of the art that he does is not supremely original per se, but for example, my son told me that it's actually not easy to do what he does, right? So is it more complex to do this in a digital way versus in a in the physical way? So there's a technique component and so on. But it was really a congregation and a collection of digital art by an artist that is um, well known in the certain, you know, uh, specific digital art loving world. And so, um, you know, there, there are a variety of artists, uh, Grimes, who has had a child with Elon Musk, um, a variety of different artists that have created NFTs of some kind um, to, you know, take advantage of this growing business. And, and in some cases, I think that they can use them for authentication. Um, for example, Nike is going to be putting this type of chip or some kind of authentication method within their shoes. Um, but in any case, I think that um, it's a it's it's just the beginning of a new world. And the Japanese artist was it was difficult for him to sell uh, a variety of his art because you you know there was a you had to go there you had to know etc. But he he found himself on one of the um, NFT gateways and his art was loved and bought and overnight he became a millionaire. <laughs> It's amazing, isn't it, how, it, I mean, well, there's no such thing as an overnight success, but I do really love the points you made about democratizing art. And I actually just listened to a podcast. It's Malcolm Gladwell's Revisionist History, and it actually looks at the physical art world and just how much of that is actually held in storage and not finger pointing at any of the museums, but many of the curators haven't even seen the pictures before. You know, it's just such a closed market so even some of the great items haven't been on display for years for the public to see so digital art to me and just that democratization of the art world is you know something quite special that opens it up to everyone and maybe not everyone can afford you know <laughs> the paintings at the amount that they're going for but it does seem to standardize the playing field a little bit but there's a fractal component to that. And it's a, there's a component for that for real estate or for art that you can buy a piece of it um, as opposed to the entire side. I mean, there is something called bit rot. So technically an image will um, decrease in its, in its value and beauty over time, but it's the same thing with physical art. Um, and to your point, 
this democratization concept is an interesting one when it comes to the crypto world because it is intended to democratize, but it isn't really since it's you know a handful of miners, for example, that control um, you know Bitcoin and and can control, for example, certain aspects about when there are releases of certain things and how they can act maybe in advance or not in advance. I'm not pointing fingers either, but it is certainly not a democracy. And whether the digital art world would then also be somewhat in the control of a few um, savvy players, so to speak. Um, you know, I, I thought we reached the top of the market when the banana was uh, <laughs> scotch shaped to the wall. Um, but, you know, this is... <laughs> We, we always think we've reached a top and then something more ridiculous happens and we <laughs> we realize it wasn't. Yeah. Um, but, but actually, just, just one more point. I would really like to go back to the that democratization point, but you also mentioned about Jack Dorsey's first tweet. I, I believe it was was auctioned for 2.5 million. So he released that as a, as a piece of digital art. I mean, it does seem okay. quite toppy right is this um or, or do you think this is this is just the start or m maybe it was just a well-timed release from his side well I believe there was an article that had talked about it um prior to its release so I don't know the chicken and the egg story with that one but I do understand the first of something right um and having a tweet from the first tweet from Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter and Twitter becoming the phenomenon that it has become. And, and Jack isn't just limited to, to Twitter, right? He's developed and it's on the board of major companies, but um, that seems like, I, I don't know about the actual value of two and a half million. I can't really opine on that. Um, but I do think the first of something like that has its value. Now it can become a historical um, instrument, a historical token over time to saying, oh, this was the first of this type of thing, first of um, the founder of this major social media platform. It can have a historical component to it and it can, you know, it can have value. I'm just not sure how it would work in terms of gaining value over time. Yeah, no, that's a great point about the first. There's always sort of value in that. And I just like to couple, touch on a couple of other points um you know you mentioned about is it really democratization because it's still controlled by just a handful of players i know that always used to be or was historically quite a big pushback of cryptocurrencies as it was controlled by a few whales who would manipulate the price but we've sort of seen that market evolve as more players come in do you like do you think that where we are now in say some of the NFTs and some of the digital art pieces that it's just because we're at quite an early phase in its development and or do you think that it's it's always it would be very hard to democratize a digital art world in the, in the same way it's been hard to democratize the physical art world so it's it's again the gateways and I, I think though the digital art component is a little bit easier because it's really the creator that creates something and that it can be tokenized and then distributed um, for sale. And so I think that that is actually the easier part to control than let's say a Bitcoin that was you know subject to very um, expensive hardware and um, engineering ability to, to mine these Bitcoins and then they're part of a community that need to validate in the proof of work, et cetera. So, so that part of it is, is really, you know, um, and it's like a federal government and the states and their powers, right? So you can kind of think about it in that sense or um, it's not a democracy, it's just a different type of central bank. Um, and there have been issues linked to, I mean, I have read, again, not an expert, but I have read about, for example, software updates that weren't happening or other issues that were blocked by, um, potentially by these miners, um, these very powerful miners. And um, some of them may, may or may not have led to the volatility of the price of the, of the cryptocurrency. Whether or not we're going to see the kind of volatility we did in the beginning to something like Bitcoin, 
you're going to see volatility, but is it going to go back to fourth? I just don't know. But I would be very surprised, especially because the Office of the Currency and Controller, OCC, has, um, has basically allowed, regulated, you know, allowed for banks to hold, you know, cryptocurrency. And that's a big change in the framework, in the regulatory framework in the United States, because it now has, has basically blessed this as an asset class. But I just, volatility will exist. Um, going back to the Hadoop um, uh, analogy, Hadoop, in what it was great for, that part is obsolete. So it's very hard for me to understand whether today's Bitcoin blockchain will not become obsolete at a certain point in time. Does that mean the value of Bitcoin will go down as a result? I don't think so. But I just don't know what I don't know in this situation. And I think that that's, a, that's it's an important part. So you can't, as a risk manager, um, increase, um, even if you think something is going up 100%, 300%, 500%, that's hope. It's, it's a prediction. It's not, uh, you don't have any kind of um, roadmap. And so you have to be careful about how you're implementing those, those strategies. But I definitely think that we're in a very different world than we were in before. I think you're showing your wisdom, Roxanne, by saying you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> and um, it was an interesting point that you raised about the banks. You know, I think over a two-week period, it seemed like every day one of the new blue chip Fortune 500 banks was making an announcement. You know, we had Wells Fargo, Citibank, uh, JP Morgan, Goldman. They're all kind of coming on one by one. Absolutely. And um, I think you guys announced Charles Schwab as well. And as an alternative, Charles Schwab is, which is a huge, huge firm, is smaller than Coinbase, but like it's a third of Coinbase's size. And Coinbase is going for a direct listing. And to that point, I, I believe I read somewhere that there was a, a big whale within Coinbase with, whose holdings were linked to Satoshi's holdings and they could be valued at $46 billion. So what would happen in a situation like that if the, those Bitcoin, Bitcoin got transferred? It's just, it'll be interesting to, to watch how that direct listing goes and what happens. But so far they're, you know, they are number one in terms of exchanges and the, many of the company's treasury have purchased their Bitcoin in the cold wallets that Coinbase has allowed, has asked. I think, it, I think everyone would just be so excited if it if it meant that we found out who Satoshi Nakamoto was. They probably wouldn't. They probably wouldn't care. It's, it's been such a, a long, you know, decade long mystery kind of thing. Um, but I appreciate we're you know we've you've given up so much of your time so generously already. But I would like to ask. You know, you have been investing in fintech companies, you've been investing in cryptocurrencies, you've been investing in digital assets. What are you most excited about now when you look at the investment opportunities uh, in this sort of digital world? Um, so I have actually learned that I, there is a lot, there are a lot of very interesting um, developments that I think are amazing. However, where I personally would focus my attention on would be in the financial services sector because I do understand that world in a granular basis. And the family office that I've been working with for the last 15 years understands that at a granular basis. So we would understand the smart contract world that is needed in fund administration or a variety of kind of boring, but yet essential, um, essential uh, services that, that, that are part of financial services. It wouldn't be um, a smart move for me to spend my time looking at the altcoins from other industries that I don't have that granular knowledge about. So, so we do rely on our manager network and, and, and friends that have expertise there to look in that. But there's definitely um, innovations in a variety of different areas that can help um, bring transparency and um, an origin to, to buyer um, track track. Um, so to speak, or trajectory. So, for example, we were looking at um, trade finance as an asset-backed um, op opportunity. So today, if you're sitting in cash, your cash may even cost you money. So you can give to these trade finance um, firms and they're backed up by commodities and it's sort of a collateralized or asset-backed um, financial opportunity. And so anything that's in that world, we are interested in and we're looking at. Um, Fabulous. There's nothing wrong with boring but necessary, that's for sure. 
Um, well, I, I just wanted to thank you so much, Roxanne, for your time today. It's been such a pleasure speaking to you and thanks for sharing all your, your knowledge and insights gained from spending so long in a family office and, and in the digital asset world. So thank you so thanks much. Thanks for having me, Rachel. Speak to you soon. Thanks, Roxanne. Bye.